Father in heaven, thank you for another evening in which we open your word and learn from it. Tonight as we continue the study on the blessed hope, may it be clear to each mind what you would have us understand and know about your soon coming. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, if you were with us last week, you uh, will remember that we began uh, this study on the blessed hope with this introduction, that um, we look forward um, to complete salvation. It is the experience of salvation. Uh, Jesus did everything for us on the cross. His death, his, his life, his death, his resurrection uh, at, at Calvary uh, paid the full price for the sins of the world. That means every individual. We experience salvation in three phases. That first phase was what we call justification. When we accept Christ, we accept his invitation to eternal life, to believe on him, we're justified. It means that we're no longer enemies of God. We become enemies when we're disobedient and um, we're no longer his enemy because we uh, accept and believe in Jesus. The second phase of the salvation experience begins immediately thereafter. The act on our part is called baptism. We're baptized into Christ or into the church, which Christ is the head of. And in that process, for the rest of our lives, we're perfecting our character, changing from what we were when we were in the world to what we are to be in heaven, in the kingdom of God. Um, Matthew chapter 5 goes to great length to talk about kingdom character. In other words, the character of those who are going to be in the kingdom of God. And that's called sanctification, that second phase. And it takes a lifetime. Why? Because our nature is sinful. So that even after we accept Christ, and we're perfected by that, even after we accept him, we still have sinful natures as long as we are on this planet and in our sinful bodies or in our physical bodies. And we long for the third phase, which is glorification. And that takes place at the second coming of Jesus Christ. Glorification means that our physical bodies, the scripture says, will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye as it's described and we put on incorruptible bodies that's when we become immortality immortality is future it's not present and we look forward to that in scripture it's known as the blessed hope so just just to 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 recap i i, I went through that introduction again uh we had gotten uh, down a ways in the discussion and I'm going to uh, turn to it. We had some slides that we used for assistance, and I'll pull those up in a minute. Uh, just to get us back on track, I want to suggest um, one or two questions for review that may help us remember where we were, where we left off last week. First, um, in order for us to experience this ultimate salvation that is the glorification what must we do and the answer was found in 2nd Timothy chapter 4 verses uh, 7 and 8 2nd Timothy chapter 4 verses 7 and 8 and essentially what it says that that uh, while we can be assured of full salvation it doesn't teach us Bible doesn't teach us that Christians are once saved, always saved. 
Uh, for as long as we have faith in Christ, our salvation is guaranteed. But the moment we turn our back on Christ through unbelief, we're also turning our back on salvation. So what warning did, uh, did the Bible give to those who are tempted to give up their faith in Christ? And the answer is in Hebrews chapter 10, uh, verses 37 and 38. For yet in a little while, he who is coming will come and will, and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith. In other words, those who are righteous, those who are faithful, <clears throat> or those who are going to be in the kingdom, will be faithful until that time. Jesus gave some, <coughs> excuse me, an admonition to his disciples in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 22. And he, he let them know that they would be hated and actually persecuted for his sake. So these were all backdrop, okay, and I wanted you to remember uh, these things before we continue in our study. So let's do that now. And <clears throat> I'm going to get back to the, to the video so that you can see um, exactly what I'm talking about, and it should be... Uh, There we are. And <clears throat> I'm going to go to another slide. Bear with me. I want to get to the to the one that I want to to begin with. Uh, that's not it. <clears throat> still searching for exactly where I want to be and that's the difficulty in stopping in the middle of something <clears throat> okay I think this is almost where we are here we are Okay, I'm going to start here. Uh, I thank you for bearing with me, uh, but I think that this is where we ought to begin. <clears throat> what admonition does Jesus give to his disciples? And I started telling you that in, in um, Matthew 10, 22. And the admonition is that they were going to be hated, but that they had to endure until the end. Essentially, Mark, Matthew 24, 13 says that. So here's the question for you. What will happen if we draw or shrink back and give up faith? What happens if we give up faith? Just go right ahead and you can, you can type in your chat and participate and we'll look forward to that. What happens if we've been believing all along but Jesus is taking a while to come what happens if we begin to doubt and give up that faith does our status change does anything change along with our thinking because if in order to be disappointed it's something that you think right you feel disappointed what happens if we shrink or draw back and give up our faith?
Any thoughts? Don't be shy. <laughs> Just go right into the chat and and share your thought with us. Well, let me read for you the answer because I have it posted there. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 39. tells us what happens if we shrink back or reverse ourselves in our faith. And I read, But we are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but of those who have faith to the preserving of the soul. So, the righteousness that saves us and entitles us to heaven is always in Christ. Is it ever in us? Do we ever become good enough in this, in that second phase uh, of the experience of salvation, sanctification, where we, uh, uh, we, we develop holy living, we perfect our characters? Do we ever come to a point where we are righteous enough to be entitled to heaven? Huh? What do you think? Of course not. You see, because the righteousness that saves us and entitles us to heaven is always in Christ Jesus. And that the devil can't touch. That he can't change. But the faith that makes us, follow me now, the faith that makes us um, have righteousness, the effect of it, that the devil can destroy. In other words, it's in our head. Therefore, the most valuable thing that Christians possess is our faith in Christ Jesus. To give it up is to give up heaven itself. Do you see that? It's all in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 39. We shrink back if you if you if you draw back or shrink back in your faith, it leads to destruction. But those who have faith, their souls are preserved. Faith in whom? Faith in Christ Jesus. It's his righteousness. Because of his righteousness that has been imparted to us that we are saved. All right, let's go, let's let's move forward. In Revelation chapter 3 and verse 11, what counsel does Jesus give us regarding this, his soon coming and why does he give that counsel? So you got to read it, right? So I'll read it. I expect that you're flipping to it in your Bibles. <clears throat> and and I'll read it and then you can give me the answer. Okay? Because what I want to know is what counsel does Jesus give us regarding his soon coming? And why does he give us this counsel? Here's here's his revel here is Revelation chapter 3 verse 11. I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, so that no one will take your crown. I read it from the New American Standard Version, um, or Standard Bible, an ASB. And I hope you got that. So, will you see my little two little question marks? What are the two things that go there? What counsel does Jesus give us regarding his soon coming, and why does he give it to us? Great to see you, Lil. Welcome. <clears throat> why, does, why does Jesus give us this counsel? Well, first, 
the first part of it, the first question mark is, <clears throat> he's coming quickly. So, why does he tell us that? So that we can hold on to our faith. He says, hold fast to what you have. And that's our faith in him. It is a saving faith. Let's keep going. There are two views of the second coming. How is the second coming of Christ looked upon by the lost? Not everybody's going to heaven, right? Not everyone enters the kingdom of God. So those who don't, how do they see the second coming? What does it look like to them when Jesus comes back the second time? Any thoughts? They're frightened by it. They are frightened by it. <clears throat> okay. What else? They're 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 afraid. You see, while the second coming is the blessed hope. For those who are expectantly waiting for Jesus to come, looking forward to his coming, it's the very opposite for people who, who are unbelievers, who don't even believe in Jesus, who don't believe that there's a gift called salvation. Exactly, Lil. Some don't believe that there will be a second coming. And... that is the beginning of the the answers are being posted there and I appreciate that John um, or Lil that is exactly what happens that there are people who who say you know what he's not coming he's just not coming um, if he was coming he would have already come um, uh, life continues the same there have been all these years of, ex of, of expecting his return he hasn't come Therefore, we don't have anything to worry about. He's not coming. Life here is all there is to it and what you get. Now all of a sudden, now all of a sudden, the sky burst open. Remember all the things that attend the second coming of Christ? There's an earthquake. It says that the, the elements burn up. You know, that's the oxygen and the carbon. It begins to burn, melt, it says. This incredible heat. And with this huge earthquake, and this is all over the place, it's not just localized. It isn't one country, it isn't one continent, but it's all over the place. And as that begins to happen, what do you think those who didn't believe that Jesus was coming will act? How will they act? How do they see his second coming? Well, as we said, they're going to be stunned. It is referred to in scripture as a great day of his wrath, meaning his, meaning God's wrath. And that's why it's foolish to reject or give up the gift of salvation that's in Christ. Look at uh, the next question. What will all the nations of the earth do when they see the Son of God coming in the clouds? Okay. First one was, 
what do they what do they feel what do they think the second one is what are they gonna do now what do you do you're shocked you're surprised you think that people will be worried at that point those who have not had faith never believed that Jesus was coming those who didn't care whether he came or not they didn't see it as anything significant and so they lived their lives uh, however they felt they should live them in, a, in other words they did not have regard for the scriptures or the warnings and the instructions and the encouragement that's contained in it for them the Bible is for weak minded people just another book a lot of nice things that are said but a lot of scary things too but certainly not something to spend your time on or with now all of a sudden the earth is in incredible movement earth earthquake flood everything happening at the same time and our world as we know it just shaken up and is this brightness getting brighter brighter what do the wicked then do what are those who it says the nations of the earth what do they do Matthew chapter 24 and verse 30 contains the answer do you know what they do what do they do? They, yeah, they'll mourn. You got that right. Do um, you think a lot of people will be saying, Oh my God. Huh? I hear that sometimes when people are shocked. But I don't think they understand what they're saying. They mourn because they see the Son of Man coming in. See, notice the contrast. The believers are going to rejoice. They'll shout for joy. This is our Savior. This is our God. We've been waiting for Him. This is the blessed hope. And those who didn't believe will mourn. <coughs> who will they be mourning for? Who will they be mourning for? Themselves, right? And it's interesting that the word mourn is used. When do you mourn? That's right, Lil. When does when do we mourn? When we're just not feeling well? No. When do we mourn? Mourning for human beings is attached to death. We mourn at funerals. We talk about the mourners. And that's it. Now, <clears throat> I really appreciate that, that, that you're here. We're privileged to have you, and I encourage you to to enter the chat, log on to the chat, and then that way you are able to um, to communicate with us. You can see the chat going up and down. Don't be shy. Um, if you're trying to be anonymous, I still won't know who you are. I won't recognize your 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 uh, your name uh, by your email. I doubt it anyway, but. Please uh, feel free to join us. Uh, you might even have a comment uh, as we <coughs> uh, go forward. It's not just a matter of answering questions, but commentary is certainly um, welcome and uh, enriches, I think, our study. All right, <coughs> let's go. Let's continue. We have 
two completely different views of the second coming or the appearing of Christ. What will the unbelievers be saying just before the second coming of Jesus? Just before he comes, what will people be saying? Hmm? First Thessalonians chapter five verses two to four. Yes. So what are people saying? That's really interesting. Did you see verse 3? What does it say? Peace and safety. People will be telling you that everything is okay. One of the concerns that I have is that as Christians, we live a life that encourages the best out of humanity. In fact, we even pray that one another uh, be well. We make an effort um, to visit people who are brokenhearted, downhearted, uh, people in need. We, we do all of these things. So if you're the recipient, if you benefit from, the, from someone else's caring and, 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 and uh, kindness, and you begin to think, wow, my life has changed. Have you arrived? Does it get better? Is there a hope that there'll be peace on earth? We have countries making treaties. We try to negotiate. We try to talk our ways into not hating each other and not trying to kill each other. Is that ever achieved? Believers know, Lil, as you suggest, that their peace and safety is in Christ. But there are unbelievers who believe in themselves as opposed to in Christ, and they also will say there's peace and safety because they will be, uh, how can I put it, intoxicated with their own success. When people are able to agree, you know, before there's a, uh, before war ends, there's usually something that brings people to the peace table. We hear that comment often, treaties are signed, <clears throat> agreements are made in order for, in order for there to be an ending or a cessation of, of the killing. And when that occurs, then people think, hey, you know what, there'll be peace. How about this example? The United Nations in New York City was built on the expectation that we'd be able to talk about our problems and end war. That there would be peace and that there's safety when we discharge our differences or reconcile our differences at the table rather than at, on the battlefield. Has the United Nations brought peace to the planet? Or do we have more war than we've ever had? Exactly. Our our sense of safety when we look at ourselves and our achievements is foolhardy because the Bible tells us in this text in fact when they are saying those are the people who do not believe who don't who who have no faith in Christ their faith is in themselves their faith is in their elected leaders their faith is in other human beings 
not in the Creator. They will be saying peace and safety and then sudden destruction will come upon them. Suddenly, like the labor pains of a woman with a child. I've, uh, we've probably all, if you live long enough, you see a pregnant woman say, oh! <laughs> it's just, oh! And you know that she felt the pain. You're in that third trimester and um, it comes on you. Um, you know that they're, that they're gonna come, but you don't know when. And then they come. And, and so the writer here of Thessalonians uses that as an illustration. But, he says in verse 4, brethren, it's a term um, used by believers. Brethren, sisters, we're not in darkness. And that day shall not overtake us like a thief in the night. We're looking forward to that day. That's what the blessed hope is all about. Looking forward to the, to the second coming of Christ. And so every day we live uh, a life prepared to meet him. Amen? <coughs> all right. That's right. Uh, scripture is replete with um, uh, w warnings, uh, predictions, if you will, uh, instructions for the future. A good place to begin, and we've already covered this in prior studies, was Matthew chapter 24, where Jesus said, Look, um, let me tell you what's going to happen before I come. And when you see these things happen, earthquake, pestilence, and so forth, no, no, that the time is not the end yet, but that I'm on my way. The time is short. In view of this above statement, what admonition does Jesus give to believers? It's found in Luke 12, 40. Because, remember, we said that endurance or patience uh, and I like the word endurance but I prefer it over patience because patience indicates passivity for the modern mind we, uh, when we look at someone and say oh that's a very pa patient man it's somebody who, who doesn't seem to react when, uh, when they're pestered okay? when they're tried but someone who endures to the end there's there's an activeness to their weight. Be ye therefore ready also for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when you think not. So even believers don't know when Jesus is coming. Now, how many of you have seen the movie 2012? or have read the book or have heard uh, some individuals whether they be pastors or preachers suggest that Jesus is coming on a specific date in the year 2012 how does that square up with the admonition that Jesus gave to believers in Luke 12 40 careful now because we don't know when he's coming and so if for someone to say <coughs> that he's coming on this particular date what does that tell us about that person that they're not a believer in scripture because scripture makes it plain 
here in Luke 12 and verse 40 it says for the son of man is coming at an hour that you do not expect how could Jesus say that if in scripture he revealed the day and the hour of his coming in fact in direct response to the disciples query about when he was coming back because they he had promised I'm coming back and he said well when 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 are you coming back how will we know and he said you know what I don't know the day or the hour only the father does so some people will the second coming of Christ will be as a thief in the night in other words the thief comes and takes what is precious to you and you are destroyed and yet it will be a surprise even to people who expect him to come but their surprise on the other hand is not mourning it's joy it is excitement do you, do you ever get a present you know for birthday Christmas whenever you knew you knew your, your your family your friends you knew somebody would do something like that but still when you get it you are excited because you didn't know exactly what it was and probably if it's packaged you still don't know until you, until you open it but because of who it came from you're excited my birthday is this Sunday and somebody walked up to my desk at work and said I didn't forget it was your birthday and handed me a card I was just I was so surprised and um, I, I, I in fact I haven't even opened it yet I guess I'm in shock and but yes it but it was but it was welcomed okay as opposed to sending me into mourning okay what will happen if you're not waiting and watching for the second advent in other words if you're not if you're just going about life and and, and feeling kind of good that there's peace in the, on the in your in your country everything's clicking you're making more money thinking about buying that second house and you're just not even thinking about the second coming of Jesus Christ what will happen if you're not waiting and watching for this second advent Revelation chapter 16 and verse 15 what happens exactly Lou you'll be caught off guard <clears throat> You need <laughs> uh, your answer says it all. You need to stay alert. Um, I like the uh, the uh, a friend of mine always says, "Be focused." Uh, you know on what you are looking forward to, and you focus on it. And and in that way, we will be prepared for the second coming. We won't know when it is. But whenever it is, we will be ready. Is that is that what you want for yourself? I know I do. Do you want that? To be ready? I hope you do too. The other part of that text that you mentioned points out that a person can be... Um, found walking naked and that his shame will be open explain <clears throat> well um, what it says I guess is that um, when you're not found waiting you're going to be ashamed it's kind of like if um, you know, you're someplace and you're indisposed, like, you know, maybe in the bathroom and somebody kicks open the stall and it's like, you're there, you're exposed, and now you're ashamed. So, it, it, the same thing happens when people are not expecting the second coming of Christ and not expecting uh, for Jesus to come, and then, boom, he's there. 
and everything that you thought was an honor now becomes a shame. Everything that you worked your whole life for, if it's not in Christ, is about to be lost. And so now you're you're ashamed, you're you're embarrassed. And those who had waited for Jesus, those who had really uh, been putting in the effort and, and, and expecting him to come, they don't have that same shame because they're clothed in the garment of Christ's righteousness, whereas all those deeds that people thought they got away with are now exposed. All those things that people did, um, you know, in hiding are now going to be proclaimed upon the rooftop. So what was done in the dark will be brought to the light, as the scripture says. One. Two, the 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 imagery of nakedness is is poignant because we don't invite people over when we are indisposed. Uh, there's a time when we are prepared for guests and there's a time when we are not. And this no no the notion that Jesus comes as a thief in the night for many means that they're unprepared. Now it may be that a believer looking forward to Jesus' coming is taking a shower. We're not talking about that. <clears throat> and the the uh, the reality is that we're not talking about that person status because you'll grab your robe or whatever as quickly as possible but it won't even be necessary because what happens <coughs> at the second coming is that in a moment in the twinkling of an eye you're going to be changed you'll be known as you were created to be known and there are all kinds of thoughts about that so uh, I don't want you to be confused but the reality is that those who are not ready those who do not believe in Christ in the Christ as he describes himself in scripture are found unprepared like a person naked when company comes and Jesus is the company that all will meet prepared or unprepared it's a sobering thought about what we do every day of our lives in this period this experience of sanctification what do we do how will Jesus respond to those who claim they deserve to be saved because of their works remember we did a <clears throat> a session on works we said that we're saved by grace by faith in the salvation that Christ offers as a gift but that we're judged according to our works so <laughs> true <laughs> not everyone that says Lord Lord um, shall enter into the kingdom now what does that suggest what it suggests to me well let me let you ask it. what does that suggest to you and maybe I should stop answering, asking multiple questions so the question is how will Christ respond to those who claim that they deserve to be saved because of their good works? Apart from me, I never knew you. Why? Why will he say that? He that work iniquities. In other words, he calls them workers of iniquity. Okay. And... <clears throat> But they thought that they were doing good because of their good works. In other words, remember the 
the parable about the uh, the sheep and the goats the sheep were on the right hand and the goats were on the left and Jesus turns to the sheep and says enter into my kingdom and because you fed the hungry clothed the naked visited those that were sick or in prison and having done that to me and they say when did we do this to you Lord we never saw you sick hungry and so forth and he says because you've done it to another person it's like you've done it to me and so those who have not been looking forward to Christ who haven't believed in the Bible they said hey great we're going because I gave to the Red Cross I gave my blood I, I, I donated to the United Way uh, I, 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 I adopted a kid on Save the Children I've done all that therefore I'm ready to go and Jesus says nope you're not going what distinguishes those who go and don't go when we look at works when we look at good works Exactly, Lil. They thought that their works could earn them entrance into the kingdom, and works will not accomplish salvation. It, the only thing that accomplishes our salvation is Christ. Now, here's the thing. It comes down to our attitude. Why do you do good things? To impress Jesus? Because if you do, you'll be disappointed. He's not impressed. But he is a knowing God. It means that God knows our thoughts and he knows our motives and he is able to judge them. No one else can, not even the devil. We can keep things in our head no one knows except God who can read our thoughts and we have to be careful exactly works are works that are accepted of Christ are those that are done as an outgrowth of the relationship with him when we are saved according to Christ's mercy or our belief in him we will have good works that that prove to everyone else that we are believers but those who do good deeds to show that they ought to be included miss the mark and will be I dare say the most disappointed when Jesus returns because they won't be going they'll be standing right alongside those people who they thought were the most atrocious despicable outright blasphemers and they'll discover that they're in the same company and that certainly will produce mourning another scripture says there will be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth I'd like to add to that um, in Psalm 51 verse 17 it tells us for thou desirest not sacrifice else would I give it thou delightest not in birth offering the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. And it reminds me of the many times when Jesus said, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. Because a lot of times, many of us look to our works as like a sacrifice that we give God to appease him and to make him happy. But God is not pleased by our sacrifices, even in things that we do for him. It's more so about our heart condition and um, how we respond to, to what he's done for us. 
there was a point where Jesus said, rend not your clothes, but rend your hearts. Uh, meaning um, that the rending of one's heart is the sacrifice that's acceptable to God. That we believe and, and hold on to our belief, not allowing anyone or anything to take away our crown. All right. <clears throat> There's a testing time. Before Christ comes, what will the last generation of Christians experience? Somebody post Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 7. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. But he shall be saved out of it. What's this Jacob's trouble business? What are we being told here? What is this testing as I like to call it <coughs> anybody what's the time of Jacob's trouble when does it occur and what does it have to do with the blessed hope that's the time that Daniel spoke of where he said that um a time of trouble will come that is so great it's unlike anything that's ever happened before and unlike anything that will ever happen again and uh, it says no nor ever shall be which which uh, basically tells us that it will be like unlike anything that's ever happened or will happen again um, so the time of Jacob's trouble is a time in which God's people uh, will be persecuted by the devil and um Scripture also tells us in Daniel chapter 12 that Michael the great prince will stand up for his people. So, when you refer to it several times, what is what is the it? What is the what is the tribulation that God's people encounter? Anybody? What do you think it is? Well, maybe what we should do to get, to, to get you on the right track in your answer is describe the literal troubling of Jacob. Okay, Jacob was, you remember, he had swindled his brother, stolen his brother's birthright, the inheritance. And his brother vowed that as soon as his father was dead, that he would kill his brother, Jacob. They were twins. But Jacob was the younger and he stole the birthright that belonged to his brother Esau. Esau was hunting him down, looking for him everywhere. And Jacob was scared to death. On one hand, he had the promise of God. And and on the on the on the other hand <clears throat> he uh, was afraid of his brother had an angry brother <laughs> absolutely he was he was just so so uh, angry yes he was and <clears throat> It seems as though <clears throat> it seems as though 
it seems as though his faith in 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 God was 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 lacking. Um, he just, uh, I, I don't know. What do you think? As opposed to before, but he was seeking forgiveness and he wasn't sure if his prayer was truly answered because he was, he was seeking um, to reestablish his relationship with his brother. But yet, there's always this question, am I really forgiven? Um, is this really going to work, or am I about to die? Right. And I think that uh, when you're thinking of Jacob's trouble in the last days, it's a similar thing, where are we really forgiven, or are we about to die? Are these people really going to persecute us? Is this the end? What's going to happen? Well, for, 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 for Jacob, uh, as you pointed out, he was so afraid that his brother would kill him, because he had said he would, he knew he was coming. He had a lot more um, soldiers and and men uh, with, with that were prepared to to do battle and to take his life. And so he was he was extremely afraid that the promises would never be realized because he was going to die. And there was a time when Jacob finally, in exhaustion. Went to sleep, but he was. It wasn't a peaceful sleep because he was scared to death. The believers in in the end time, like Jacob, will think that they're not going to be saved. In other words, that they're going to die. Why? Because of their past sins. But like Jacob, they will have already confessed their sins. And God has accepted them. First John 1 John 1.9 If we confess our sins, and he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of unrighteousness. And therefore, we are saved even during this time. As someone indicated, <clears throat> the time of Jacob's trouble at the end time is takes place the the, the, the the convincing of our of whether or not we have sin is prompted by the devil and takes place in our minds we'll think and look for any unconfessed sin that we may have before God that would keep us outside of his kingdom and we will agonize over that have we confessed everything? And there's a writer who says we won't be able to find any unconfessed sin because we've confessed them all. And as John indicated, there's a time when Michael, another name for Christ, stands up and says this is it. And he comes. And because after the time of Jacob's trouble, those who are believers are going to receive a death sentence from those who are not. And the irony is, those who are not think that they're doing God's will. Yeah! Imagine that! They're saying, you know why we don't have peace on earth? It's because there's these group of people running around saying they believe in the Bible. We need to get rid of them. And once we get rid of them, then everybody will be in harmony and we truly will have a better place to live. And that comes just before the return of Christ. It says Michael stands up, says it's finished, and he returns. And not a single believer will lose his life at that time or her life. Isn't that comforting? that yes we've got to go through the time of Jacob's trouble but remember what Jesus said he that endures to the 